Hello, this is Mike McGowan from NOAA. Welcome to the NOAA webinar series. The goal of the NOAA webinar series is to create a library of presentations on subjects of interest to the albinism community and those interested in albinism. The topic for this session is sun protection. While sun protection is, very, is a very important issue for those with reduced pigment in their skin, the harmful effects of the sun pose a danger to all people. The information presented in this webinar is of particular value to those with albinism and those who care for children with albinism, but it is good information for everyone. NOAA is fortunate to have a number of scientists who are willing to give of their time and to share their knowledge in service to the albinism community. Today's presenter is one of those very generous and caring professionals. Aisha Sethi, MD, is an assistant professor of medicine at the University of Chicago Medical Center. Dr. Sethi treats patients with common and com complex skin disorders. She has expertise in tropical and travel dermatology, ethnic skin dermatoses, and skin conditions related to HIV organ transplantation and skin cancer. Dr. Sethi attended medical school at the Aga Khan University Medical College in Pakistan and thereafter completed her postdoctoral fellowship, internship, and residency in dermatology at Yale University, where she also served as chief resident. Dr. Sethi has an interest in the study of global infectious diseases with dermatological manifestations. This interest has led her to Pakistan, Malawi, Peru, London, and Tanzania for, for field work on dermatological issues in travelers, immigrants, and minority populations. Dr. Sethi also collaborates with educational institutions in developing countries to promote the field of dermatology. She is especially interested in addressing global access to medical care, as well as collaborating with educational institutions in developing countries to improve the availability and quality of medical training and dermatological therapies. Her work in Malawi led to the first National Awareness Day for Albinism, held in the capital city of Luang. Luangay in uh, 2007 with the advent of a weekly dedicated albinism clinic. More recently, her albinism awareness work in Malawi has been featured on the national media there and in, as was reported in the University of Chicago magazine. Dr. Sethi serves as the American Academy of Dermatology's volunteer liaison to the Regional Dermatologi Dermatology Training Center in Tanzania and is a member of the President's Circle of the Chicago Council for Global Affairs. She is a member of uh, the Education and Volunteers Abroad Committee of the American Academy of Dermatology, the Board of Scientific Advisors for NOAA, the International Affairs Committee of the Women's Dermatological Society, and the University of Chicago's Global Health Initiative. In 2009, she organized the first North American Tropical Dermatolo Dermatology Seminar in the country hosted by the University of Chicago, which featured several international experts in the field of tropical skin diseases. Again, we are very, very fortunate to have this brilliant scientist who was kind enough to lend her time to us. So, Dr. Sethi, welcome. Thank you, Mike, uh, for that very long introduction. Thank you very much. I feel honored to be part of NOAA. Uh, NOAA's community and uh, my talk uh, is going to focus today on um, sun protection. Um, I have uh, lectured on this to the NOAA community at past conferences, so hopefully this will be useful to people uh, who weren't able to make it to the conference to the talk and I'll be giving some recent updates that came uh, about uh, sunscreens in the last week by the FDA. So we're talking about sun protection today and um, this is uh, an image of the sun, and this is uh, a bright star that is a source of many things uh, to us humans that live on Earth. Uh, we'll be talking about the sun, um, albinism as it relates to uh, pigment, uh, and uh, why we need to protect our skin if we have albinism, UV rays, and what you can do about maximizing uh, sun protective measures. This is just a surface image of the sun. It's also called Sol or Helios. And sun has been a source of uh, fascination uh, since many, many uh, centuries uh, in Egypt. Ra is the god of sun. 
uh, whereas sun worship, um, it's also common in India. There's a, um, a sun god uh, that Hindus uh, consider uh, holy. And of course, um, tourism is a big uh, attraction. Wherever we have sunny beaches, uh, we want to go out, we want to enjoy being on the beach, and this is where sun protection comes in. And of course, we also have the advantage of the sun, uh, sun's UV rays uh, uh, giving plants uh, the means of uh, uh, growing. And uh, nowadays, we're looking into alternative energy sources. So you should not forget that uh, the sun, besides its causing skin cancer, is a very huge source of solar energy. There's a few facts, and you can read these on this slide about uh, the sun being at the center of our solar system. And uh, it's about 5 billion years old, and what its mass is made up of. And it's amazing. The energy output of the sun is about 386 billion billion megawatts. So you can imagine why we want to use this as an alternative energy source. Uh, this is. Uh, what I deal with uh, some of the time in my clinic. Um, this is uh, uh, the back of a patient. And what you see over here is a classic sunburn. And a classic sunburn, the skin has erythema, which is redness. And you can see it's red where probably the patient uh, forgot to put on sunscreen. The other thing you're seeing here on this patient's back are these light brown circular spots. And these are not moles, per se. These are called lentigos, which are just an increased number of pigment cells. And these happen and accumulate over time. And they're just a marker of how much sun exposure cumulative you've had over the years. So this is a classic sunburn uh, with redness. And the next step would be peeling. And then the skin becomes dry and flaky. A very bad sunburn is characterized by blisters. They get these fluid-filled bubbles. And that's what we ask our patients. Have you had three or more blistering sunburns before you were 18? And that increases your risk for getting skin cancer. So this is hopefully what it will lead to, um, that uh, once you've uh, once bitten, twice shy. So next time, hopefully, uh, the patient seen in the previous slide will use more sunscreen. And when we biopsy, um, an area of the skin uh, where you've had a sunburn, you will see a dying skin cells. So this is a slide showing you on the left-hand side the different uh, sections of the skin. So the top layer of the skin is called the epidermis. And then the deeper layer of the skin is called the dermis. The dermis is where uh, the skin's blood supply is. And the epidermis is the top layer, which you can touch. And this is made up of keratinocytes. Uh, keratinocytes are sort of the jigsaw puzzle that are holding the epidermis together. Collagen, uh, which uh, decreases as we get older, um, is uh, what makes up the dermis, the second layer, along with the blood vessels. So when we get a sunburn, what happens is you get inflammation in the second layer of the skin. Uh, you get all your immune system acting up. And that leads to uh, cell damage and leads to what we call cell death or apoptosis. So on the right-hand side of this slide, what you're seeing is a dying keratinocyte. And that's called a sunburn cell. So the more of these cells that die, the more higher risk there is that one of these cells might undergo mutation or a cell change that the cell, cell just will not stop multiplying. And that will finally lead to skin cancer. So this slide shows us uh, different varying degrees of uh, skin pigment. And uh, varying degrees of skin pigment is defined by the melanin we have in our skin. And melanin is a skin pigment. And melanin sort of is our um, natural uh, sunscreen or sunblock provided by nature. So if you have darker skin, you are uh, somewhat more photoprotected, but uh, the risk uh, is still there. So we still do need uh, sunscreen. However, in albinism, uh, where there is a decreased or absolute loss of uh, pigment, this is uh, the highest category in which you absolutely need to protect your skin. Just a picture here from Malawi from our albinism awareness 
work and um, we're handing out sunscreen over here and starting a registry. You see some of the patients have a lot of those brown uh, marks on their face, uh, which tells you that they've had accumulative a lot of sun exposure. Just some more pictures. And this is just, um, we need education everywhere for uh, albinism. And this is just a poster from Malawi that shows, um, put on your sunscreen, wear a wide brimmed hat, get your eyes checked, and you should be sitting in the front um, uh, section of the classroom. And that's what we're doing here today with this lecture, just increasing your awareness about what is it that you need to do to protect your skin. So I'll just go a bit into the background of albinism, which most of you uh, must be familiar with. Um, albinism is a, a genetic uh, condition uh, caused by uh, mutations in uh, the protein um, uh, that makes up the skin, uh, the melanin. So melanin is produced by uh, these skin cells called melanocytes. And melanocytes actually are derived embryonically from these cells called the neural crest cells. And what happens is when the embryo uh, is being made, uh, these neural crest cells actually um, uh, become the melanocytes and they migrate to the skin, the eye, some parts of the brain, and the inner ear. So depending on their migration pattern or the genetic disorder, uh, some forms of albinism uh, may be associated with uh, hearing abnormalities, and you can see the skin and eyes involved, so that's why the condition is known as oculocutaneous albinism, and vision might be affected. So albinism, uh, the major uh, determinant of normal skin color is uh, how active the melanocytes, the pigment-producing cells are. So it's the quantity and the quality of the pigment produced, and it's not the density of the melanocytes. Just an important factor to remember. And what produces um, melanin is actually the melanosome, which is the site where melanin is made. This is just a piece inside the melanocytes which produces the melanin. So somebody who has darkly pigmented skin, they have uh, these melanosomes which are larger and contain more melanin. So darkly pigmented people do not have more melanocytes, rather their melanosomes have more melanin and are larger. And this just shows that um, um, uh, melanosomes inside a melanocyte uh, where you have uh, two kinds of melanin, eumelanin and uh, pheomelanin. Eumelanin is a brown-black uh, pigment and pheomelanin has a slightly yellowish tinge to it. Melanin uh, is produced by melanocytes, and then it is transferred to the top layer of the skin called the keratinocytes. And it is over here that uh, the pigment is uh, dispersed and degraded. And uh, the key enzyme in um, albinism, uh, inocular cutaneous albinism, is tyrosinase. And what tyrosinase does, is it, it, can, uh, it is responsible for the conversion of tyrosine which is an amino acid, to uh, melanin. And um, uh, if you look further into this um, graph, um, OCA1, OCA2, OCA3, and 4, these are different types of ocular cutaneous albinisms. And you can see that some of these have total absence of this enzyme working. Tyrosine is negative in this case. Uh, uh, the phenotype will be absolutely blonde hair um, with the nystagmus. And as we go down OCA2, there is some uh, tyrosinase activity. So you will produce some pigment. And um, uh, the color of the hair uh, will be a slightly um, uh, light uh, yellow-brown uh, color. And then, um, again, different types of arcalogenous albinism. We know there are some protein uh, mutations. And uh, there's ocular albinism in which there is no skin involvement, so just something important to remember. There are types of albinism with no skin involvement. Just a picture again of two brothers, and over here you see on the left-hand side, um, he has what we discussed before, those lentigos or those brown spots, which are not moles, but they actually are a marker of uh, sun damage or sun exposure. We'll go on to talk about ultraviolet rays. Um, um, these are the main uh, rays that are being emitted by the sun. And uh, we'll discuss further which one of these are uh, blocked or um, at least inhibited by some of the sunscreens that are available. 
UV rays uh, were discovered by um, a gentleman named Johann Ritter from Germany. And um, uh, through his experiments, um, uh, we now know that um, uh, what end of the spectrum that we uh, couldn't see um, beyond that of visible light is what he termed as ultraviolet light. So that's what we know uh, in present day as UV light. Just going over the skin structure again, we saw this in the previous slide. I'm just going to go over it again. So the top layer is the epidermis, and then on uh, the bottom layer, um, the second layer of the skin is the dermis. Again, the epidermis consists of the keratinocytes. Those are the cells that we saw a picture of one uh, undergoing cell death uh, called the sunburn cell. And then the dermis is the layer on the right-hand side that contains the collagen, the elastin fibers, and the blood vessels. So this is just a picture that when there is a, a sun exposure, um, what happens with uh, tanning is that the melanocytes actually disperse pigment into the top keratinocyte layer. So this is just showing you pigment dispersion into the keratinocytes with uh, UV exposure. And it's important to know uh, that there are different kind of uh, UV rays. Uh, so namely, there's UVC, UVB, and UVA. And these are in order of increasing wavelength. Uh, UVC is important because most of UVC, thankfully, is blocked by the ozone layer. And UVC is extremely carcinogenic. Um, uh, however, there are uh, parts in the ozone over um, uh, parts of Australia, New Zealand, where there is ozone missing. So there is a higher skin cancer incidence in um, that part of the world. Uh, what uh, in North America uh, we're concerned about is uh, UVB, UVA, and um, increased uh, wavelength actually translates into deeper skin penetration. It's important to remember that we associate uh, being at the beach and, um, and in the sun with UV exposure or sun exposure. It's also important to remember that actually UV uh, exposure and sunburn risk actually goes higher with higher altitude. So actually skiing vacations should also be associated that you should be using your sunscreen or sunblock as with high altitude uh, UV exposure increases with that too. Just a cartoon here showing um, uh, that uh, with increased wavelength you actually have penetration into the second layer of the skin, so UVA is a higher wavelength and UVB pretty much stops uh, in the upper dermis and UVA goes uh, down further. Another cartoon showing um, the penetration of UVC, UVB, and UVA rays in the different layers of the skin and uh, we'll define what they do. So. UVA rays are the most common, and these are the ones that cause skin cancer, aging, and wrinkling. And tanning beds usually use UVA rays. UVB rays um, uh, cause sunburns, um, so the um, uh, immune system damage actually is caused by both UVA and UVB. And UVC is the most carcinogenic one. However, like I mentioned, that's uh, blocked by the ozone layer. So. Natural sunlight contains much more UVA than UVB. And uh, just I'm going to mention some chemicals here. Avobenzone is a UVA blocker. And UVA is responsible for delayed pigment darkening and aging. And this is responsible for immune system damage and skin cancer also. It's important to remember that um, we do need UV rays uh, for vitamin D synthesis. Uh, I will give you a website. It's www.aad.org. That's the American Academy of Dermatology website. So you can go over there and look at the vitamin D statement for, uh, and really you need minimal uh, sun exposure on a daily basis to get your vitamin D. If you are concerned about it, you should actually get your doctor to check a vitamin D level, um, and it's easily supplemented. And uh, and to get your vitamin D does not mean that you should not be using your uh, sunscreen or sunblock. And UVB radiation is the one that's responsible for converting pre-vitamin D3 into the active form. 
So the short-term effects of ultraviolet exposure when we're out in the sun is getting a sunburn or tanning. And if we were to biopsy the skin of somebody who's had a sunburn or uh, immediate tanning, you would see inflammatory uh, immune cells in the skin, dilation of the blood vessels, um, some of the immune cells being depleted from the skin. And um, uh, if you were to do cellular and molecular studies, you'll see uh, proteins um, um, that are upregulated in the skin due to damage or stress proteins, as they are called. And in uh, higher um, areas of uh, uh, cell death, you would actually see that um, uh, in the skin, the top there, the keratinocytes will be undergoing cell death. And those are the ones that we showed called sunburn cells. This is kind of the cascade, what happens in a simple manner. You get UV exposure. Uh, you get DNA damage within a cell. The more um, cumulative damage you're causing, the more the risk that one of those cells is uh, going to mutate or undergo a change uh, in the genetic makeup of the cell. And the formation of mutations, uh, one of those cells might go on to just multiply and multiply and multiply and not have a stop signal, and that's what composes cancer or skin cancer, and we call that malignant transformation. These are the different skin types uh, in which classically dermatologists um, uh, evaluate patients. So we have type 1 through type 6. Uh, Fitzpatrick is the dermatologist who uh, uh, are, these are named after. So type 1 skin is a uh, very white uh, skin with uh, red hair, perhaps, and someone who always burns. And type 6 skin is very dark black skin, uh, uh, a patient who might report that I go out and I never burn. So most of our patients who have albinism will fall under type 1 um, skin type. Rarely will it be type 2. So SPF is actually the uh, the definition uh, which you will see uh, on bottles of sunscreens, what does it stand for? So SPF stands for sun protection factor and MED is a term used in dermatology and it's called minimal erythema dose. So what is the MED? So MED is uh, that suppose you have 20 human subjects and they have skin type 1 or 2, the one that always or usually burns. And we have a light source that mimics the solar uh, spectrum, so the UV light from the sun. And we determine uh, how much uh, of the uh, light did it take to produce redness in uh, the protected skin with the lotion versus the unprotected skin. And SPF is calculated by the uh, MED of the protected divided by the MED of the unprotected. So an SPF of 15 means that it took 15 times more of that um, MED to cause a sunburn. Um, so um, what does that mean? Uh, so higher the SPF, yes, it is better. However, the percentage blockage of that redness-causing radiation doesn't change much after about 30. So your sunscreen should be SPF 30 or above. On a daily basis, if you're using a 15 on the face, that's fine, but really it should be SPF 30 or above. What else uh, should you do? So this is a campaign that was very popular in Australia. Australia has uh, some portions where the ozone is missing, so very high rates of skin cancer. So they had a slip, slap, slop campaign. So just think about it's not only putting on the lotion, should be wearing a long sleeve t-shirt if possible, a wide brimmed hat, and then stop, off, uh, stop on some of the sunscreen. Uh, sunscreens are divided, um, so we use the term sunscreen very commonly when um, uh, used in uh, the layman uh, language. So we use the term sunscreen and sunblock in dermatology. So sunscreen are chemicals that actually absorb photons or these particles that are uh, coming, uh, composing the UV light. Sun blocks are physical um, blocking uh, uh, chemicals that scatter the photons. So you see on the left hand side, it's a cartoon showing uh, the photons being scattered so they just bounce off 
the skin surface as opposed to sunscreen where you have the chemical that will absorb these. So here's the confusion as there's so much out there on the market, what do I buy? And just this past week, uh, the FDA came up uh, with um, uh, new regulations in uh, collaboration with the American Academy of Dermatology. Um, the statement for this, again, you can find at www.aad.org, and you just search for a sunscreen statement. But I'll just go over some few pertinent points from that. What should you look for? So first look if it says sunscreen or sunblock. Like I mentioned, for the number, it should say broad spectrum on it. So going forward, we probably will have labeling changes also. But it should say broad spectrum. Most of the sunscreens that we have out on the market um, currently block UVB uh, rays. Uh, there is not a lot of effective UVA blockers. So if uh, make sure it says broad spectrum on it, first of all. And then you should look if it says UVA blockage also. Because UVA is a big cause for uh, skin cancer and um, aging in the skin. So. These are some chemicals uh, to look out for. Avobenzone is a UVA blocker. Oxybenzone is a UVB blocker. And Mexoril um, is actually um, e capsule. So again, look for these and UVA blockers. But as long as it says broad spectrum, SPF 30 or above, um, right now you should be good with that. If you are willing to use something that's more pasty and you don't mind using a block, blocks are great. Um, they stay on a bit longer sometimes. Uh, blocks uh, are going to be made up of chemicals called titanium dioxide or zinc oxide. So another thing to look out for when you're in the drugstore is that it says broad spectrum sunblock. Again, SPF 30. Helioplex is a chemical you'll see on uh, some companies' uh, products. So Helioplex is just a trade name for broad spectrum UVA, UVB. This is good also. So UVA uh, is the avobenzone part, and UVB is the oxybenzone. So this combined together is uh, called Helioplex. Um, look out for avobenzone. Um, Again, we have problems. Uh, there's not a lot of great UVA protective uh, sunscreen chemicals out yet. Problem with a lot of UVA sunscreens is that they degrade easily in the light. So you need to add chemicals that are called photostabilizers. Um, and these photostabilizers you'll see in the ingredient section of the sunscreen. Common ones are octocrylene and cyclodextrin. Just some tips, so gener generously apply a broad spectrum, uh, ho hopefully a water resistant if you're going swimming, and with an SPF of at least 30, um, you should reapply approximately every two hours, and this is true even on cloudy days, UV light does get through on those days too. Uh, so as long as you're broad spectrum, water resistant, at least 30, uh, you should be good. Uh, if you don't like the pasty kind, there are uh, sprays available now. Those are great. Um, children love the sprays. And then uh, another good thing for children is you have sun sunscreen or sunblock sticks, and you can rub those around on the face, and um, uh, easy to apply. Protective clothing, long sleeve shirt, wide brimmed hat, if possible. And the highest uh, amount of uh, strong sun rays are between 10 a.m. and 4 p.m. So that's kind of an avoidance factor, if one can possibly. We mentioned that beaches are uh, classically associated with sun exposure, uh, but don't forget um, skiing vacations, high altitude, um, that's also a higher risk of UV exposure. Um, uh, please don't seek sun uh, uh, seeking behavior uh, to get vitamin D. You can get it safely through a healthy diet. And please go to the website I mentioned, uh, aad.org, to see the vitamin D statement. And tanning beds are an absolute thing to avoid uh, for our uh, uh, community that has albinism. It's an absolute no-no. So that's a uh, absolutely should be avoided. And just once a year at least, depending on your family history also, uh, you should see a dermatologist. An annual skin check is uh, just something uh, 
everybody uh, uh, should be doing uh, uh, who has albinism. When should you go sooner than the year? If you notice anything on your skin, a new bump that keeps on scabbing up or uh, just keeps on flaking, give it about three to four weeks. If it doesn't heal, you need to get that checked out. Uh, a skin lesion that does not heal can be one of the first signs of skin cancer. Any pre-existing mole you had or any new dark spot you have that has an irregular border, has two or three different colors to it, is itchy or starts bleeding, basically anything you've noticed a change on, that's a good thing to get checked out and just uh, have it put to rest. Skin cancer is extremely treatable and um, does not usually spread anywhere. I'm talking about basal cell and squamous cell if caught early. Melanoma is the skin cancer we are most worried about because that has a higher risk of spreading elsewhere. So just an annual skin check is a good thing to do. So just a little cartoon here about sun protection. And I'll just go over these slides because um, new regulations just came out in the last week. So previously, uh, FDA had changed terms from waterproof to very water resistant. So that's what you'll see on the sunscreens currently. And uh, we're thinking if it should be named sunburn protection factor. But in your sunscreens, what you should look for is the broad spectrum and the UVA, uh, especially, uh, uh, protection factor. So this is what happens when you have um, non-sun protected skin. And these are all signs of sun damage. So on the top uh, left-hand side, you're seeing some deep furrowing, wrinkling because of collagen damage. Uh, so this is something that we see. And then on the right-hand side, top right-hand side, you're seeing some redness on the neck. So as collagen becomes less in the skin uh, with aging and sun damage, you can actually see more redness and more broken blood vessels easily on the skin. On the lower left-hand side, you see lots of collections of blackheads. Blackheads are actually uh, skin protein that's oxidized, and um, this is a sign of extensive sun damage also in older people. If you sometimes see a lot of these blackheads clustering together, that is a sign of cumulative extensive sun damage. What we are worried about is what you're seeing on the bottom right-hand side. This is squamous cell skin carcinoma. So you just see a ulcerated sort of a bump here. Um, and this is the one I was mentioning that if something's not healing, keeps on looking like a big scab, squamous cell skin cancer can look like that. So these are just some factors. If you've had more than three blistering sunburns before you were 18, please see a dermatologist. Any rough spot that doesn't heal in about four weeks, get it checked out, or something that keeps on um, scabbing over. Any pigment and or size being irregular is something that should be examined. Uh, this is basal cell skin cancer. It looks like a little round bump, usually with some uh, red lines or broken blood vessels on it. It can start scabbing in the center. This is another basal cell, so any new bump that's just grown in size um, uh, rapidly, um, get it checked out. Uh, this is uh, in a patient with albinism. You can see that um, sun protection was uh, not done here over time, so you're seeing those brown spots we had shown earlier, the lenticles, and then you're seeing near the nose this big uh, scabbed up, uh, uh, crusted bump with the black crust. So this is squamous cell skin cancer. And you not only have one, but you also have one uh, near the ear on the right side. So this is a very uh, worrisome for squamous cell skin cancer. Another area not to forget about using sunscreen is the lips. So um, a, a lot of uh, the um, lip balms uh, come with sunscreen now, so just make sure you're putting some on the lips also. Don't forget your neck and uh, your ears, They're just two areas sometimes uh, which we might uh, forget. Again, more skin cancer here in another patient with albinism. Uh, she has some precancerous skin lesions uh, on the face that feel like little rough spots, and then uh, squamous cell cancer on the right-hand side on the cheek. This is what melanoma looks like, so just a few pictures. So 
uh, we talk about the A, B, C, D, and now there's an E also. So it stands for asymmetry, irregular border, color being a few different hues, and diameter more, being more than uh, 6 millimeters. And E stands for evolution or any change like itching or bleeding you noted in a dark uh, spot. Uh, get those checked out. And another thing to check before you head off for the day, I'm sure there's an app for this on the iPhone or, or Droid or whichever phone you have, smartphone, and you can look up the UV index on weather websites. And this accounts for cloud cover, location, geographic location, and ozone. So a higher um, um, 1 to 10, 1 being the lowest, 10 being the highest, a high UV index means you just need to be more vigilant on that day. We talked about different skin types and needing different levels of skin protection today. And uh, hopefully this was educational for all. And then get your examination done at baseline and then at least once a year. And then hopefully um, this will lead to uh, what we in dermatology call smart and safe fun. And um, hopefully you enjoyed this talk on uh, sun protection. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sethi. That was a wonderful presentation that I'm sure will bring uh, knowledge to many people. Um, NOAA will sponsor a uh, question and answer session in the form of a teleconference in the future. Please keep uh, an eye on your email box and announcements will come from NOAA. Again, thank you very much, Dr. Sethi. This uh, concludes our presentation on sun protection. Thank you, everyone.